Hello guys, this is Paul McCorder with TopTechBoy.com and we're here today with episode number 45 in our incredible new tutorial series where you're unleashing the power of your Raspberry Pi Pico W. What I will need you to do is pour yourself a nice tall glass of ice cold coffee. That would be straight up black coffee poured over ice, no sugar, no sweeteners, none needed. And as you're pouring your coffee, as always, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at SunFounder. SunFounder is actually sponsoring this most excellent series of video lessons. And in this class, we will be using the Kepler kit for Raspberry Pi Pico W. Now, most of you guys probably already have your gear, but if you don't, look down in the description. There is a link over to Amazon, and you can hop on over there and pick your kit up. And believe me, your life and my life are going to be a whole lot easier if we are working on identical hardware. But enough of this shameless self-promotion. Let's jump in and talk about what I am going to teach you today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my solution to the homework assignment that I gave you in lesson number 44. But I might, must start by asking how many of you were successful? If you were successful, leave a comment down below. I am legend double chest bump. And if you were not successful, leave a comment down below. I fold it up like a cheap Walmart lawn chair. <clears throat> now, I hope some of you guys were successful. I will admit that this project turned out to be a little more challenging than I thought when I, when I assigned it. It's very simple conceptually, but practically getting it to work, I had a little bit more trouble than what I imagined. And so I look forward to seeing your solutions that you post to YouTube and you guys can see kind of how I, uh, how I solved the problem. But what the assignment was, the assignment was to take your board with your Raspberry Pi Pico W, the MPU 6050 and the OLED 1306 and create something that would measure <clears throat> vertical distances and you would measure those vertical distances by taking your board dropping it and then measuring the time that it takes to land and then take that time and to convert it into a height that it traveled through okay so where would we start on a project like this <clears throat> We want to think like an engineer. And how does an engineer think? He starts by drawing a picture and sort of scoping it out on paper. And once you have it done on paper, then it's pretty easy to code up. So we will switch over here to the sketch pad. I do it on the little electronic paper so you guys can see it a little bit better. But normally I do these things really on real engineering paper. I love working with a 0.5 millimeter HB pencil, mechanical pencil, <clears throat> and some engineering paper. But today, today we will simply be doing it on the old sketch pad. All right, so let's start by drawing a picture, okay? So I'll start by kind of dropping a coordinate axis here for you, like that. Ah, that's no good. I am just <clears throat> sometimes too much of a perfectionist for my own good, but that is going to look good like that. And then we'll come over here like this. Okay, we have a coordinate axis. On the <clears throat> horizontal axis, we have time. And on the vertical axis, we have acceleration. Now, what am I going to be measuring? I'm actually going to be measuring the gravitational force in the z direction. So I'm measuring that gravitational vector in z. And when I'm just sitting there and not moving, when I'm sitting there and I'm not moving, what do I measure? I measure 1g. Okay, I will come up here. I will measure 1g. Now I come across like that. <clears throat> it's not moving. I'm measuring 1g. Now what happens when I drop it? What we learned last week is when you drop it, you measure what? You measure 0g. So when I drop it, so let's mark this as when I drop it, then I'm going to measure what? I'm going to be measuring 0 Gs. And then I'm going to be measuring 0 Gs as long as it's from leaving my hand until it hits the ground. Then when it hits the ground, it's going to again 
measure what? It's going to come back again and measure 1g. So I measure 1g. I drop it. While it is dropped, it's going to measure 0g's. And then when it hits the ground, again, <clears throat> it will measure 1g. Now, what happens to that when I drop it? When I drop it, it experiences the acceleration of gravity. And as it experiences the acceleration of gravity, it will be accelerating towards the Earth. It will be accelerating towards the Earth at a rate of <clears throat> 32 feet per second per second. So that's just something we need to know. The acceleration of gravity towards the Earth is 32 feet per second per second. <clears throat> now, if you enjoy working in the metric system, it would be 9.8 meters per second per second, like that. Per second per second or per second squared. You can write it either way. Now, what is the acceleration going to be after I drop it. It's going to be a constant 32. So while I'm sitting there holding it, it sees 1g, okay, but it has zero acceleration. So it's going to come down here like this. Now when I drop it, it starts accelerating towards the Earth. And so it is going to accelerate at a constant, it's going to accelerate at a constant acceleration of what? 32 feet per second per second, like that. Okay, 32 or 9.8. And then when it hits the ground, it's going to go back and its acceleration is going to be zero and it's going to see that 1g. Now this is the really important concept. The time between when I let it go and it hits the ground. That is the time that it is dropping. And so what we are going to call this, we are going to call this time here, we're going to call this time here T drop. Okay. How do we get T drop? We measure it because here I'm measuring 1g. As soon as I let it go, I measure 0g, and then when it hits the ground, I measure 1g again. So I just measure it, that time that my board and my z-axis accelerometer were experiencing 0g. Now that's t drop. <clears throat> okay, so while this thing is dropping, the acceleration is constant. But what about the velocity? Well, the velocity is equal to the acceleration times the time, okay? And so let's drop another axis here and let's think about that, all right? So I will, uh, I'll try to make a straight one for you, okay? So we'll come down here like this, drop an axis for you, okay? And you can see that, all right? And so now what is going to happen? Well, this is going to be looking at the velocity. This is going to be looking at the velocity as a function of time. So as I'm sitting there holding it, what is the velocity going to be? It's going to be zero. Then I get here and I drop it. I drop it and then what happens? It accelerates, meaning the velocity is going to get larger and larger and larger. And if we look at this, this is a linear equation. Velocity is equal to acceleration times time. Velocity is like the y-axis. Uh, time is like the x-axis, and if you think of y equal mx plus b, then the acceleration becomes the what? It becomes the slope of the line. But this, my friend, this is a linear equation. So we're going to come here to this point, and then we're going to drop it, and then it's going to accelerate, and the velocity is going to equal the acceleration times time until what? Let me come on over here until what? Until we reach this point, and then it hits the ground, and it what? It stops. And then when it stops, the velocity goes to zero, and then it sits there at zero. Again, how long is it in the air? <clears throat> it's in the air for t drop. All right. Now, what is this point? This is the velocity max, and that is equal to the acceleration times 
the t drop. Okay, the acceleration times the t drop will give you that because its velocity is acceleration times time. The full amount of time times the acceleration, that's going to be the maximum. So the v maximum is the acceleration multiplied by the time that you dropped it. Okay, now what we've got to start thinking about is <clears throat> we've got to start thinking about like now that V max, that's the velocity it's going right when it hits the ground. That's its fastest point right then. So I know that. But my problem is not to calculate the velocity when it hits the ground. My problem is to calculate the height that it's fallen. <clears throat> well, what's another equation that we know? We know that distance is equal to rate or velocity times time. Okay, distance is equal to velocity times time. But the velo this is only true if the velocity is constant. And if we look over here, the velocity is not constant. It starts out at zero and it goes all the way up to V max. And so I can't just say the distance is V max times T because it hasn't been going V max the whole time. So what would we do? We would figure out the average velocity and we would say that the drop distance, the distance that we drop is the average velocity times time. Well, if we start at zero and we end up at V max, then what is, <clears throat> what is the average? Well, it is the average of V max and zero. And so it would be like this. This would be our average velocity. This would be V average. And what would V average be? V average would be equal to where we start, which is V start, plus where we end, which is V max, divided by two. That's the average. Well, where do we start? We start at zero. And so what's the really cool thing? The really cool thing is therefore the V average is just going to be V max divided by two, okay? What is V max? We know it. It's the acceleration times the T drop. So because of that, I can now say the V average is equal to V max, which is the acceleration times T drop over two. So now what do I know? I know the V average. And I also know the acceleration in English units is 32 and I measure T drop. So what I could do now is I could figure out V average. All right, let's go ahead and put the 32 in there. So what I'm gonna say is, <clears throat> I'm gonna say I'm gonna have to get out of your way. I'm gonna say that the V average is equal to 32 times T drop divided by two. Now I have V average, I measure T drop and I know 32, and so now I have V average. Well, what did we say the distance that you drop was? It would be V average times T drop, right? Distance is velocity times time. Now, do I know V average? Yes, I do. So what can I write now? D is equal to V average which is V max divided by two. So that is going to be V max divided by two times T drop. Okay, now what is V max? Okay, what is V max? V max, we put up here, V max is the acceleration times T drop. So we have that. We have that. So what do I write? D is equal to V max, which is acceleration times T drop divided by two and then multiplied by what? T drop. So I've got T drop times T drop. That's going to be T drop squared. All right, now we also have to remember that we do know that acceleration is 32. And so let me write the whole thing again up here. And this is our final result. D 
that we've dropped is equal to the acceleration of gravity, which is 32 times T drop over 2 times T drop. And I'll write it one more time. D is equal to 32 divided by 2 is 16. And then T drop that squared. Okay, so where do I get T drop? I measure it. How far did I fall in feet? 16 times T drop squared. Now if I want D, I'll try to find a thing here. If I want D in inches, I need to say that is 16 T drop squared times 12. And that will convert D in feet to D in inches. And I want inches. So this is going to be the equation we used. OK, did this make sense? Did this make sense? Where do I get T drop? I start my stopwatch when I drop the board and I see zero, zero G, and I stop my stopwatch when it hits the ground and I don't see zero G anymore, I see one G. Now that I have T drop, now I can calculate inches. How is that? Okay. Guys, if that didn't make sense, I really think I explained it. If it didn't make sense, go back and watch this again and kind of follow through it step by step, and I think it will make sense. Okay, now, let's go in and let's see if we can hook this thing up. First thing that you're going to need to do is you are going to need to hook your circuit up. So I'll need you to go to the most excellent www.toptechboy.com. Use this happy little search icon and search on something like schematic for a tilt meter <clears throat> or using the MPU 6050, uh, something like that. You will come to this schematic. You can see that I've got two I2C devices. I've got the 1306 and I have the uh, and I have the MPU 6050 and that's pretty easy to hook up. I've got the SCL and SDA hooked up to GPIO pins 2 and 3 here and 16 and 17 here and you can go here and you can actually hook it up exactly the way that I have it hooked up. But I don't want to slow down and hook it up for you and so I will just come over here where I already have it hooked up. Now the first thing that you're going to say is Hey man, what's with all the rubber bands? Well, I told you that I was having some challenges with this <clears throat> and the challenges I was having is as I was playing with it and dropping it, when it would hit the ground, it would shake and you would get a little bit of noise in your I2C buses and that noise would cause the program to crash. And so what I found is you really have to kind of secure this down so you don't get any electrical noise by things you know, kind of jumping around and therefore getting clean measurements and clean signals. And I found I kind of had to use a rubber band to get this to uh, to get this to work correctly. But that's one of the problems I had. My programs kept crashing every time I dropped it. And so this was sort of the solution that I came up with. With that all hooked up, let's go ahead over <clears throat> and let's fire up Thonny and let's see if we can get this thing programmed. Let's go ahead and grab this uh, Come back over here to www.toptechboy.com. Okay, and that was the schematic. Then here we've got a little code that will help us to get the uh, to get the uh, MPU 6050 up and running, so that we don't have to start completely from scratch. We don't want to start completely from scratch. <clears throat> and so I'll come over here and I will paste that. And then if we run this, it should just be measuring X and Y acceleration. That's good, okay. But we don't want to measure X and Y acceleration. What do we want to measure? We want to measure Z acceleration, and we'll do it like that. And then we're not going to print anything out. We're just going to measure Z acceleration. Now, what we're also going to want to do, besides measuring the Z acceleration, what are we doing? We're going to be measuring one. We want to see it go to zero. We start our stopwatch, and then when it hits the ground, 
the Z acceleration is going to go back to one and then we stop our stopwatch and then we have just measured what? We've just measured T drop. But we're going to want to display that. We're going to want to display that on the, we're going to want to display that on the OLED. And so we've got to go ahead and kind of set up that OLED. <clears throat> Let's see if there's anything else. We've imported IMU, we've imported machine, we've imported time. We are also going to need to say from uh, SSD 1306, you need to import SSD 1306 underscore I2C like that. And I got to remind you that this IMU library and this SSD 1306, you have to install those libraries. I think the IMU installation I did in lesson 40, and then <clears throat> the SSD 1306 library I installed in like using an OLED in one of the earlier lessons in this class. Okay, so here we have the MPU 6050 set up. Let's go ahead and let's set up the OLED. So I'm going to say I2 C2 because this is going to be a second I2C bus and that is I2C the method, I2C the method. <clears throat> and this time we are going to be on channel one and we're going to have for SDA, we had that connected to pin two and then we had SCL for the 1306. We had that connected to pin three like that. And then we're going to want a frequency equal to 400,000 just because we can. And now we want to create our DSP object, our display object. So DSP is equal to SSD 1306 underscore I2C. That's our method. And we got to tell it what is it. It's 128 columns by 64 rows, and we are going to use I to C to bus that we just created. All right, let's go ahead and clear the display just in case something was on there. We'll say a DSP fill like that, and we want to fill it with the zeros, and then Let's go ahead and say dsp.show so that it clears anything that's on the screen. So let's go ahead and run that, just see if we have any mistakes. Okay, it's not doing anything. Why is it not doing anything? Because there's no errors and we don't have any print statements. So basically, <clears throat> The point here is, is that it is not crashing, and that is a good thing. Okay, so now we, we're going to come in here, and we're going to keep measuring the Z acceleration, and we're going to start our stopwatch. We're going to start our stopwatch at the point that it is dropped, when we see the Z axis acceleration drop below 1. Okay, and so what I want to do is I want to set a flag here saying flag equals zero, meaning at this point we have not yet seen a drop event. So at this point we haven't seen a drop event, so we'll just set flag equal to zero. And I think this will make sense in a minute. Now what we want to do is we want to put some labels on the screen. So I'm going to say dsp.text text. And what do I want to put? I'm going to tell the user to hold still. So when you're going to drop, you've got to hold it still, not be moving it. You've got to hold it still. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm going to put that at column zero, row zero in pixels. Now I'm going to put dsp.text. And now I'm going to say this time, ready to drop, meaning it's ready for you to drop that thing. Okay, and this one will be column zero, row 16. So that would be like the second line of text on the little OLED. And then let's go ahead and show that. So I'll say dsp.show like that. Okay, and now after I've shown it, I'm going to erase it. So I'll say dsp fill. Okay, this DSP fill zero, it doesn't erase the screen, it just erases the buffer. So next time you show, you don't show the same thing again. I'm starting with a clean slate, if, if that makes sense. Okay, once we do that, now we make our Z axis acceleration measurement. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to start my stopwatch. T start is equal to time dot ticks. 
and I'm going to measure in milliseconds. So that, this will give us the number of milliseconds since the epoch. Okay, the number of milliseconds since the epoch. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say while z acceleration is less than or equal to 0.95. That means it's been dropped. It's measuring a, a, a z-axis acceleration. It's measuring 1g. And then when you drop it, it quickly goes to 0g. So I'm saying if it's less than 0.95, you got a drop on your hands. Well, when you have a drop on your hands, what do you want to do? You want to just sit and measure z acceleration until you hit the ground. And then you want to stop your stopwatch. Okay, so while it's less than 0.95, I'm just ticking off time from t start. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to say z acceleration is equal to mpu dot mpu dot excel dot z like that. And now since I've come into this loop, I'm going to go ahead and say flag equal one. <clears throat> meaning we have now had a drop event. We have now had a drop event. And now when it's no longer less than 0.95, now we've hit the ground, what do I want to do? I want to stop my stopwatch. I'm going to say T stop is equal to time dot ticks dot time dot ticks underscore milliseconds like that. So now I have my stop time. Now I can do T drop. What is the drop time? That is T start minus <clears throat> T stop. That makes sense. Now, if I've actually had a drop event, I want to go print the results and do the calculation. So I'm going to say if flag equal equal one, why would flag equal equal one? Because I had a drop event and I ended up in this loop. And if it ended up in this loop now, what do I want to do? Well, what I want to do is that T drop was in milliseconds. But remember, we're saying acceleration is 32 feet per second per second. We're working in seconds, so I need to convert that to seconds. So I'm going to say T drop in seconds is equal to t drop in milliseconds times 0 0.001. So I'm converting milliseconds <clears throat> to seconds. Now, what is the height? HT is equal to, what did we say? 16 times t drop in seconds, right? Times uh, t drop in seconds. 16 times t drop in seconds times t drop in seconds, right? It was times t drop squared. So I got to multiply it twice. And that's 16. <clears throat> and then if I want to convert feet to inches, what did I do? I divided by 12 like that. I divide, no, did I divide by 12? I am, I am in feet. And so to go to inches, I need to multiply by 12. To go to inches, I need to multiply by 12 feet to inches, you multiply by 12. So now I've got the height. Now let's go ahead and start displaying this stuff. So I'm going to say display text. And what do I want to display? I'm just going to say drop detected because it had the flag equal one. It saw a drop. Drop detected, put a space there and then close it. And where am I going to put that? Column zero, row zero. Now I'm going to say dsp.text, and now I'm going to say uh, the height. I just calculated the height, and now I'm going to display the height I just calculated. <clears throat> so I'm going to take that string height, and I'm going to concatenate it with the string value of t drop in. Do I want to display it in milliseconds? I want to display it in milliseconds, okay? I'm going to display it in milliseconds. I did that wrong. It's HT, right? I want to do the height like that. And I think this height up here, I'm going to go ahead and round that. I'm going to round that to one decimal place. So I don't want 
inches, I just want to round it to one decimal point. Now I think that will do it. Then here I will display the height like that. And then let's see if I can add to that. I don't know if I have space, but I'll try to add to that inches. How does that look? I think that's pretty good. So drop detected. <clears throat> the height was this. And let's also put in the drop time. DSP text. Let's show the drop time. And so this is going to be drop time that we just measured. Might be useful in debugging. And then plus string of, and then I want T drop in milliseconds because I think that will be a little bit easier to read. And then this is going to be up. What did I forget up here? I need to say this is column zero, and the next line would be 16 pixels down, so that would be row 16 in pixels. And then here it is going to be zero, <clears throat> and then I think about 26 would be the third line of text. And why did I drop 16 pixels between the first and the second? Because I wanted to get beneath that yellow region at the top of the screen. But then after that, I can just drop by 10 pixels for each line of text. It's what seems to work pretty good for me. Now I'm going to say dsp.show like that. And then I'm going to uh, time.sleep of five seconds. And then I'm going to say, we're done with all this nonsense. So we're going to set the flag, the drop flag to zero again. <clears throat> Why do I want to sleep for five seconds? I want to sleep for five seconds because if I drop it and it gives me a reading, I want to have time to see what I'm reading. I want to have time to see what I'm reading, if that makes sense. And then it's all going to be displayed. It is all going to be displayed on this little screen here. All right, and so I think the first thing that we will need to do is we will need to run this just to see if we get any errors. Now, what do I expect? If I run this, I expect to not see any errors. I'm not printing anything, so I won't see anything here, but I should up on my little display here, I should have it tell me, okay, hold still, hold it still, or what did we say? Yeah, hold still and ready to drop. Now to try to calibrate this a little bit, <clears throat> I kind of made this box and you can see I've got it labeled one, two, three, up to nine inches. And that way I can hold it against that gauge to see if I'm kind of doing it right. You won't see that box, but as I'm moving this up and down, as I'm moving this up and down, I'll be kind of using that box to gauge things. It is a little bit hard to do it perfectly, but we will see what happens. Okay, so let's go ahead, let's run this and see what happens. Ah, line 22, invalid, right off the bat. <clears throat> if ZXL is less than or equal to 0.95, that, oh, <laughs> while. <laughs> I invented the while loop. While, I hope you guys caught that. Okay, let's go this time. Okay, no errors, and then look over here. You see that we are getting our message. Let's come over here and see if we can see it full scale now. I'm going to try to come up to an inch, and I'm right at an inch. It says ready to drop, and I'm going to drop it, and I did not get a measurement. Why not? Ah, uh, I have an error. So if you look, the reason I didn't get a measurement is module has no attribute ticks. So that is in line 25, time.ticks underscore <clears throat> milliseconds. Let's try it again. Okay, ran that time. Let's come back to this full view. And I'm going to come up to an inch. And then I'm going to wait for it to say, I don't know, let's see. It seemed to kind of hang there. Let's see if I can do this again. Okay, let's see. Let me unplug it. <clears throat> if in doubt, unplug it. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to run. Okay. Darn it, I thought I cleared that thing out up here at the top. <clears throat> I have flag equals zero. And while true. And then while Z acceleration is less than or equal to 0.95, I go in, make flag equal to one. 
But it seems like it's dropping right into that for a reason that I don't understand, and it's detecting the drop right off the bat. So am I really measuring Z acceleration correctly? Ah, what did I do here? Did you guys catch that? This is a horrible mistake. This is a horrible mistake up here. I said Z acceleration, but I was what? Measuring X. That would explain that problem. That one really scared me. That one scared me pretty bad. Okay, so now I've got the hold still. That's good. Let's come where, where you can see it. Let me set my little calibration tower up there. Now I'm going to try to pull this up to one inch, and I'm going to drop it. And look at that. <clears throat> it says 1.5 inches, and then now it says to try again. Okay, so now I'm going to go, let's try two inches. Okay, so I really try to get it right at 2 and drop it, <clears throat> and that said 2.4 inches. So it seems like I'm measuring like a half inch more than what it is, but let's keep going. Let's see what happens. I've got it at 3, and now it says ready to drop, and that time it said 4. Let me try that again. That was pretty far off. Ready to drop. Okay, that time 3.2. That was pretty accurate. Let's come up to four, waiting for the ready to drop. I've got the ready to drop, and so I'm going to drop it. And that read 5.7 instead of four. Let's go to five. Wait for the ready to drop. Five. Okay. And that read six. Let's go to six. Ready to drop. <clears throat> and that read 6.4. Let's go to 7. I'm at 7. I'm going to drop. And that read ready to drop. Let's try it again. Let's wait for the ready to drop. 7. And it read 9.4. So you see it's reading a little bit on the high side. 8. For 8 inches, it me measured 9. And then finally, I'm going to come up to 9, ready to drop. And it measured 11.7. So overall, <clears throat> I'm measuring an inch or two more than the actual drop distance. I'm measuring an inch or two more than the actual drop distance. Part of it that I think might be going on is, part of it that might be going on is, is that this cable might be sort of slowing it down a little bit. And because it's going a little slower, it's in the air a little bit longer. Because you see that cord has a little bit of resistance. It's like the cord is trying to hang it up a little bit. I think the interesting thing would be to do this again and to use the little portable battery and just drop the thing without anything it all connected to it. I also think it'd be interesting to go outside and like drop it off the roof or something like that and see how the accuracy holds up for greater distances. But I think it's really, it's really working pretty well. The other thing that I found is, is that it works a little better if you can get a really clean, like that was one inch and it said 1.2. Okay, ready to drop. Let's see, ready to drop. That was two <clears throat> and it said two. Let me try this. Okay, that is 3, and it said 3.9. Let me try that again. 3.2. Okay, so part of it seems to be trying to get a really clean drop where you're not dropping it so that it falls kind of wonky. You want to get a real clean drop where it just goes straight down, and then I think you get a little bit more accurate measurement. But I think this is a pretty neat little project. And I do now need to give you, I need to give you a homework for next week, right? I need to give you a homework for next week. So what have we learned so far? We've learned <clears throat> how to operate the MPU 6050. We've learned how to measure acceleration in the X, the Y, and the Z directions. We've learned that. And then what else have we learned? We have learned our trigonometry. So now this is your assignment. Your assignment is to make your very own <clears throat> tiltomatic. When your tiltomatic is flat, 
it should be reading zero degrees in pitch and zero degrees in roll. And then as you tilt it, it will show you this is like a little level, that little circle, it's your bubble, okay? So let's pitch up. What happens when I pitch up? The bubble goes up, okay? What happens when I pitch down? The bubble goes up to the high side. So the bu bubble is always going to the high side, okay? And then also I can roll, the bubble goes to the high side. I can roll, the bubble goes to the high side. And I can come like this, the bubble goes to the high side. The bubble goes to the high side. And so this also what you can see is on here, it's not just a visual indication with the bubble, but you can see the pitch. So it actually gives me an angle. Like here, I've got a pitch of 10 degrees. I've got a pitch of 10 degrees and a roll of zero. Here I have a pitch of minus 18 degrees, or I could have a roll of 18 degrees, a roll of minus 18 degrees. And so I get a quantitative readout of the angle of pitch and the angle of roll. So that is your homework for next week. Guys, I hope you're having as much fun taking these lessons as I am making them. Uh, want to, as always, give a shout out to you guys who are helping me out over at Patreon. You guys are the ones that are keeping me in the game right now. YouTube is not showing me any, me, me any love these days. And so really what's keeping me in the game, making this great content week after week, is you guys that are helping me out over at Patreon. Thank you. Thank you for standing with me. Really appreciate your support. You can also help me by giving me a thumbs up. Also helps if you leave a comment down below. If you haven't subscribed already, subscribe to the channel. When you do, make sure that you ring that bell so that you'll get notified when future lessons drop. And most importantly, share this video with other people because the world needs more people doing coding and fewer people sitting around watching silly cat videos. Paul McCorder with TopTechBoy.com. I will talk to you guys later.